So this is my masterpiece lecture. Uh, and I don't think anyone has ever attempted something like this. So it's the one I'm most proud of. Um, and uh, I wish I had a recording of when I've done it uh, for people. There's another version of this that's for medical student interest groups, which is a little thinner. Uh, you can watch that if you are a med student. This is for residents and fellows, and uh, it's called Everything. So I hope you enjoy. So welcome. Today is my rather long-winded attempt to answer the question you will inevitably be asked, what is PM&R? I want to warn you that my slides may be intimidating because I wanted to share as much explanation as possible, but you'll enjoy it more if you focus on the pictures and what I tell you rather than getting lost in the slides. My name is Gautam Malhotra. I did work full time at the VA and enjoy a part time and enjoyed a part time private practice. Now I'm uh, full time. Uh, I'm a graduate of the uh, same program that I'm now a clinical professor. Actively, I was teaching at the bedside and didactics, general physiatry, electrodiagnostic principles. I genuinely love helping and meeting people, so feel free to reach out to me uh, to me with any questions anytime. It's amazing that all of our friends training in other specialties don't face this question of what is their specialty. In fact, if you Google their specialties for images, the first hits are right on the money. But when you Google pm &R, you get a picture of a physical therapist and this generic guy wearing a stethoscope. They're clueless. It's not limited to the internet, though. I think our field is uniquely unknowable by everybody, including our patients, medical students, and even us, unless there's purposeful inquiry. I was once sitting where you are, as demonstrated by this portrait of my residency class, exuding extreme professionalism. <laughs> I remember throughout residency having a vague feeling of what it meant to be a PMR doctor. But after studying for the board exams, I realized that residents really have no idea just how enormous the scope and extent of our field truly is. I remember telling my study buddies, why didn't they just show us all of this on the first day? A lecture on everything. It would be a seamless coverage of what we are and how we got here. The muscle as our organ system and everything that can go right and wrong with it. This would lead to cardiac, pulmonary, vascular, and mobility rehab. Then we'd hit cranial stuff, spine stuff, outpatient topics, and everything that didn't fall into those. You know what? Since no one else will do it, I'll take it on. So here it is. PM&R everything. One resident called it a nice roadmap for learning. Another said it was a great way to scare her into studying for the boards. So one caveat illustrated by the picture of everything, which is certainly impressive in its scope, but overwhelming if you zoom in and try to look at every detail. Similarly, this lecture is an attempt to share the scope of everything in PM&R without having you get lost in the details. It's just like meeting people. You're not going to remember everyone you meet at a cocktail party, but you will be familiar with the fact that you once met them if you bump into them in the future. So just to really get the informality going here, I would like to get us all on the same page and address the elephant in the room. I can confirm that these are all questions I've been asked, and you will too. With regard to what makes me different from a physical therapist, a question my dad, a physician himself, actually asked me. Well, it's like your primary who prescribes a specific medication, dose, and schedule for taking it for your blood pressure. But he doesn't actually make the pills or dispense them. Similarly, I figure out what's going on with you, prescribe what the therapist should dispense. Pain management is a subspecialty that can be pursued by anesthesiologists and PM&R docs. They learn where to put needles up and down your spine. I don't do that because I'm a general physiatrist. Orthopedics is a surgical field that focuses on bones, joints, ligaments, and tendons. Neurologists look at brain, spinal cord, and nerves. These days, they do a lot with vessels, too. Physiatrists overlap these two fields, and we're probably the only ones preoccupied with muscle, too. Ultimately, we are here to restore function, whether it be the athlete who needs to be able to go back to dunking, the warehouse employee with back pain, or the little old man who had a stroke. We figure out their optimal functional level and use every non-surgical evidence-based trick in the book to get them there. So where did this field come from? For the physical medicine side of things, there is evidence that physical agents were employed in ancient times. 
Heliotherapy is lying in the sun for heat and hydrotherapy is using water for wounds and pain. These got more sophisticated as the tech got better. The rehabilitation part can be traced to wars where they discovered that you could get a soldier back to the war zone quicker with exercise than just sitting around the radio playing cards in a sanitarium. Although there are tons of people who should be on this slide, these two seem to get all the credit because they were instrumental in getting the field recognized when no one wanted to adopt us, including the leaders of internal medicine and orthopedics. We learned a lot about the administrative evolution when Dr. Cruzen's personal journal was made available. It's really no surprise that we still have to explain ourselves when you realize that compared to the other medical specialties, we're among the youngest to be recognized and organized. In 1938, we got called physiatrist to identify the physician specializing in physical medicine. They wanted us to say physiatrist to avoid confusion with psychiatrist, but everyone says physiatrist anyway. Dr. Dillingham took a stab at a definition. It's wordy, but it really does a great job. We don't perform surgery and aren't limited to one kind of treatment. We can be consultants, inpatient primary providers, or team leaders. Dr. DeLisa's textbook goes deeper and asks more of us. We should be comprehensive and address prevention, increased independence, and improved quality of life. We use every trick in the book. What we do should permeate the entire healthcare system. So Dr. Joel DeLisa dedicated a good portion of his professional career on advocating for and progressing PM&R, in addition to optimizing the Kessler Residency Program where I trained. His textbook was indeed a force to be reckoned with. Although most of us agree that PM&R doesn't own a particular organ system, Dr. DeLisa proposed that muscle is our organ system. It is truly involved throughout the continuum of our diagnostic and therapeutic world, whether it be brain injury, spinal cord injury, amputees, pain, sports, or neuromuscular medicine. So let's dive into this organ to perhaps gain a better understanding of our field. The purpose of muscles is to move and or stabilize bones. So here you see a bone and the tendon, is a non-contractile tissue that attaches the bone to a muscle and transmits force or tension to the bone. The muscle belly is what we see with our eyes and it has a name like biceps. Each belly is a bundle of bundles called fascicles. The fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers, each of which is a single multinucleated muscle cell. The cell is packed with these myofibrils, which themselves are comprised of filaments. In medical school, you saw these thick and thin filaments repeating under the microscope. Each segment is called a sarcomere and is the muscle's histological unit of contraction. If we look at a sarcomere, the way the muscle shortens is that the thin filaments interdigitate with and slide along the thick filaments. This is called the sliding filament theory. For this to happen, when calcium attaches to troponin, it moves tropomyosin out of the way so that myosin can interact with actin. This is called the power stroke and obviously requires ATP energy. So that was probably the fastest summary possible of what you learned in biology and histology. So for moving, we need energy and that basically means ATP or other phosphates. There's a whole bunch of that just sitting around in the muscle and that gets used up first. As you continue moving, glycolysis converts sugar to energy. This is anaerobic metabolism. If you keep moving, mitochondria can then use oxygen to squeeze out, squeeze out every last bit of energy from the byproducts of glycolysis. The yield on this aerobic uh, energy production is phenomenal compared to anaerobic. So the more your muscles can use this aerobic oxidative process, the more efficient the system is at doing work. Uh, we'll talk more about this when discussing exercise, but after a certain point, there are only so many mitochondria and more work is only going to be powered by anaerobic systems. We can now talk about neurons. Whether the muscle fiber is going to be good at using oxygen or not is determined by the motor neuron that innervates it. One way we can determine this is by staining them. Type 1 fibers have lots of oxygen using mitochondria and citric acid cycle enzymes. Type 2B fibers pretty much only use glycolysis and then type 2A uh, do both, they're somewhere in between. There are a bunch of muscle stem cells lying around waiting to, be, uh, to help out in case of injury or exercise. When staining, we get this beautiful mosaic of interposed type 1s and type 2s. But if a motor neuron is damaged or dies, 
its neighboring motor neuron will collaterally sprout to adopt the orphaned muscle fibers. Unfortunately, we lose the mosaic when this happens. Muscle makes an enormous contribution to the body mass. Other than movement, it offers protection, heat and energy production, metabolic regulation, but today what we're really interested is, uh, in is the generation of movement and force. So let's get to that good stuff now. In my mind, you have normal muscle the way I just described it for you. If you do stuff with it, you get stuff. And my goal is to define all of that for you in a practical way. Dynamic exercise will lead to aerobically conditioned muscles. Lifting weights and push-ups will lead to strength. And stretching will lead to better flexibility. On the other hand, this slide is the essence of PM&R. If you don't use it, you lose it. You'll notice I've put some familiar forms of inactivity here. Inactivity leads to deconditioning, weakness or loss of strength, and contracture or loss of range of motion. Physical inactivity is the fourth leading independent risk factor for death caused by non-communicable diseases. Let's start with one of the easier concepts. If you stretch, you get flexibility, and if you don't, you lose it. So these terms may initially seem interchangeable, but they mean different things to a physiatrist or a therapist. The noun form of range of motion designates the measurable limit you can move at a joint. Flexibility is how much of this you can do without pain. Mobilization moves a joint through its range of motion without applying a deforming force, while stretching defines any activity that does apply a deforming force along the rotational or translational planes of motion of a joint. You can either observe the range of motion or actually measure it with a device. Believe it or not, there are lots of ways to stretch. Passive is what you normally think of as stretching. Isometric means you're also firing the muscle. PNF is more complicated and requires a therapist. Dynamic is like the woman on the left with repeated movements. Ballistic is this, but amped up and can cause injury. And the kitten stretching here is just too cute, even for a dog lover like me. So this is all the good stuff. But what happens if we don't move? Contracture is, comp is compromised motion, and it can be due to lots of things. Joints can get hurt or lock up. It's not directly related, but I wanted to digress a moment. Joints develop because we move when we're embryos in our mommies. Loading, unloading, and motion all cause the synovial fluid to suck and squeeze like a sponge to offer nutrition. When we don't do this, like say in this rabbit who was immobilized for 6 to 12 weeks, the bones become degenerated like someone with moderate osteoarthritis. So not moving is bad for joints. Contracture can also occur if the connective tissue or skin congeals up. If you don't move, the connective tissue surrounding the muscle shortens and eventually, slowly, the muscle loses sarcomeres, and that contributes to contracture. So that's the good and bad of the motion. Let's talk about strength and weakness from a muscle perspective. I'd like to clarify some vocabulary about muscles generating force. When force is generated quickly, it's called strength, and when you fail, it's called weakness. When you can do it many times or over a long period of time, it's called endurance. If you can't, it's fatigue. When a muscle generates force without changing length, it's called an isometric contraction. When the contraction is accompanied by a change in length, it can be concentric with shortening or eccentric with lengthening. When you use a machine to enforce constant speed of motion, that's called isokinetic contraction, and it's only really used for research. Most of us measure static strength with manual muscle testing, which is technically called the classification of the Medical Research Council of Great Britain. The one repetition maximum is the maximum weight you can lift once and fatigue out. Prescriptions for strengthening can be based on a percentage of this. Isokinetic is the research stuff I told you. And then you can use various equipment to objectively measure strength. We call it resistance exercise when strengthening the muscles by lifting weights or using machines. Using higher weights is more effective, but if someone is injured or really debilitated, you might opt for low weights with more repetitions. Progressive resistive exercise, or the DeLorem protocol, starts by figuring out your 10 repetition maximum weight. That's the amount of weight you can just lift 10 times before fatiguing out. You use that 
to then figure out 50%, 75%, and full amounts of weight for 10 reps each. Oxford is the reverse. The Dapre is sometimes known as pyramid training and is similar to the, to the Delorum, but decreases the number of reps. I've included a summary of the ACSM uh, guidelines for healthy folks as well. The early strength gains you see with resistance training are really a reflection of optimizing your motor neurons in the brain, spinal cord, and periphery. I'm showing the rockets kicking together to convey how much stronger we get when our neurons similarly fire in synchrony. As resistance training proceeds, the various myofibrillar po proteins ramp up in production until the muscle cell starts bursting at the seams. Those type 2C stem cells we mentioned earlier also contribute to hypertrophy. The 2B cells start building more oxidative machinery, collateral blood vessels grow, and transcription of glucose transporters increases to make exercise mother nature's metformin. Eventually, you get more sarcomeres and stronger connective tissue for better force transmission. So, if you don't move, loss of strength or weakness occurs. This is referred to as disuse atrophy. Your body says, why am I putting any energy into this organ if it's not being used? So right away, with immobilization bed rest, you start preferentially losing sarcomeres in your oxidative anti-gravity muscle fibers. The collagen doesn't break down, so as a result, you get stiffness. This contrasts with atrophy from nerve injury. All the muscle fibers belonging to that axon will wither away unless collateral sprouting occurs, and then you lose that mosaic pattern, which we talked about already. If you have a myopathy, proximal muscles tend to be affected more. What about just getting older? At this point, we think it's a combination of the disuse issues and less of the youthful stimulating factors in the body. Since we're talking about weakness, I just want to digress for a moment and acknowledge that now that you're going to be physiatrists, weakness means something completely different than it did on your medicine rounds. There were a ton of things that you were looking for before that are usually already ruled out before we see them in our clinics. Clinically, my general approach to is to systematically work my way from proximal to distal along the neuraxis. So let's quickly review the appropriate neuromuscular anatomy and physiology. Sensation is in teal here, and it begins with a stimulus in the periphery that travels through the nerves and plexus to reach the cell bodies located in the dorsal root ganglia just outside the spinal cord. Another axonal projection goes up the spinal cord and then synapses abound within the brain. Conversely, the motor pathway starts with a thought in the brain, an upper motor neuron crosses over somewhere, and synapses with the lower motor neuron in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. The axon, the lower motor neuron axon, traverses the ventral root, plexuses, peripheral nerves, and then causes movement. This whole motor pathway is what we are going to spend our time thinking about today. So let's deepen this discussion. The term motor unit refers to the anterior horn cell, its axonal projection, and all of its associated terminals, junctions, and muscle fibers. Here you see two motor neurons projecting to a muscle belly. The blue one has many neuromuscular junctions with a set of muscle fibers inter interdigitating between muscle fibers belonging to another motor neuron in red. Finally, we get to cardio. Since this can be a difficult topic to navigate at first, I'm hoping to somewhat simplify the literature on this. Cardio is really called dynamic exercise, which is any repetitive rhythmical movement of large muscle groups, and it should be enough work to overcome your muscle's aerobic ability. It should be often enough to turn on the genes, ideally daily. It's only going to benefit the muscles that are worked out. Basically, you have to break a sweat. You can measure the intensity by looking at heart rate, asking how hard they think they're working, or by the settings on the machine. There are three parts to a workout. Uh, starts with a five-minute warm-up to get the blood flowing and loosen up the joints. Then you do the hard work for about a half hour. Finally, don't just stop. Decrease to a mild pace so that you don't get venous pooling. Uh, when my wife and I went back to the treadmills in the gym, we stopped after 30 minutes suddenly, and I said, babe, are you dizzy? She said, yes. I said, turn the treadmill back on. That's called venous pooling. Yeah, the blood that should be going to our brains is hanging out in our legs. That means we're out of shape, deconditioned. Anyway, I just want to or orient you to these curves where the x-axis is how hard you're working and the y-axis represents how much oxygen your body is consuming. As you can see, this is a linear relationship and then it plateaus at a certain point. 
When looking at these graphs, always start on the left at rest when your body is at its lowest metabolic demand. Then see what's happening all the way to the right, which is the maximum workload. This is when your mitochondria can't make use uh, of any of the extra oxygen that the heart is sending over. This is called your aerobic capacity or anaerobic threshold. And it's what we want to improve when, with the conditioning exercises. Everything in between these extremes is called submaximal exercise. This is an important place to be for rehabilitation of many neurological conditions. So here's the story that no one tells you about exercise. During a bout of exercise, your muscles need oxygen and energy to move, so the vessels to the muscles open up nice and big. This decreases peripheral resistance, so less blood is sent to the gut and kidneys because we don't need to pee or digest right now. The autonomic nervous system kicks in to get your heart beating faster and harder. This keeps increasing until you max out. A lot of the energy used by the muscles is released as heat through the skin. So imagine this in your advanced neuromuscular patients. It certainly might raise some concerns. That's why it can be a good idea to get a baseline exercise tolerance test to see how much they can safely tolerate. Br briefly, there are all sorts of ways you can test them. Then you can create an individualized exercise prescription allowing an optimal level of training without exposing the patient to undue risk. So, you're a good girl and follow your prescribed regimen. You'll get more blood vessels to the muscles, better insulin sensitivity, and best of all, more mitochondria and more optimized mitochondria. I'm sure you already know all the benefits of exercise already. The cardiovascular benefits are that your maximum aerobic capacity and cardiac output increase. So you can do more work with the oxygen you're given, and this puts less demand on your heart. And yeah, you feel good too. Now the bad news. If you don't move, it's awful. All of your body systems are jacked up, as you can see from this table on the left. You get osteoporotic, orthostatic, swollen, you get ulcers, Chem7 chem will be out of whack, um, constipated, ventilation perfusion mismatch, sleep disturbance, compression neuropathies, and the muscles we kind of already talked about. When all of this happens, it's called deconditioning. It's your body's normal reaction to not moving, to not use resources when they're not needed. In the early 1900s, people were put to bed rest. Based on what we know now, I tell my patients that bed rest is poison. And unfortunately, many of our rehab populations are afflicted with this in addition to their other diagnoses. So that was my whirlwind presentation of exercise science as it relates to physiatry. It essentially boils down to the body having a continuum of responses to the type and amount of activity or inactivity it's exposed to. So from here, we can take a number of different directions. If you take the stuff I just taught you and apply it in the context of a particular disease process or setting, that basically is what we call rehab. If you use exercise in the context of cardiac disease, that's cardiac rehab. Pulmonary or vascular disease, pulmonary rehab and vascular rehab. Of course, I'm oversimplifying. And you need other things like these. But perhaps the most important component is that it's interdisciplinary. Or do we mean multidisciplinary? In fact, do you guys know what the difference is between these words? Don't worry, most people can't articulate the difference. The way it was explained to me is that multidisciplinary is what you're used to seeing in a hospital. All the services come to do their thing at bedside, but really don't communicate much with each other, except maybe through the chart. Interdisciplinary is when they behave more like a team, arriving at consensus on diagnosis and management. Transdisciplinary could be when everyone can do each other's jobs to some degree. Dr. Kirschblum's spinal cord team functioned this way when I was a first year resident. It takes years to become transdisciplinary. So if you use an interdisciplinary approach to restoring function in the setting of cardiac disease, it becomes cardiac rehabilitation. Indications are on the left and contraindications on the right. Let's look at the actual cardiac rehabilitation steps after having a heart attack. The goal of the first phase is to expedite the hospitalized patient home, safe, and independent. Early mobilization and education starts in the CCU, and ambulation progresses on the wards. For a month, you want them to just take it easy at home while their infarcted myocardium scars over. Then we exercise them for about a month. Finally, lifestyle changes have to be maintained in order to reap the benefits. 
How about obstructive pulmonary disease? You all know that COPD is progressive dyspnea and deconditioning due to irreversible obstruction of the vessels and airways, usually attributed to cigarette smoking. Better than me, you know that they should be treated with meds, oxygen, vaccinations, and counseled to stop smoking. All of that plus exercise is an in an interdisciplinary setting is offered with a pulmonary rehabilitation program. Along with respiratory therapists, we teach energy conservation and secretion clearance techniques. Now, all of this pulmonary rehabilitation will not change pulmonary function tests or mortality, but there is improvement in walking, ADLs, dyspnea, and decreased hospitalizations. Remember how many of those you saw as an intern? Those could have decreased with pulmonary rehab. I just want to make one nuanced comment. Although cardiac and pulmonary rehab are essentially doing the same interventions, the reasons are different. We are optimizing the skeletal muscles in the peripheral in the periphery to be more efficient and require less oxygen in order to decrease demand on the heart. Whereas with pulmonary rehab, we want to optimize function because the lungs are doing a, cr a cruddy job. We're not worried about infarcting the lungs. We just want to do more with less. This is actually the same thing with vascular rehab. As you all know, especially in smokers, blood vessels can get blocked up and cause claudicating leg pain. There are meds, surgeries, and invasive procedures that can be offered, but you can also exercise them to increase their muscles' ability to do more with less, just like with pulmonary rehab. They have to frequently push through the pain to get any benefit, unfortunately. And unfortunately, many of them will require amputation when other treatments have failed. So this is a nice segue to amputee rehabilitation. As a physiatrist, you may be needed for pre- and perioperative issues, but the bulk of our care happens post-operatively where goals are optimizing pain management, wound care, and preparation for a prosthesis. Very often, we develop lifelong relationships with these individuals. The prosthetic and management options are highly dependent on the level of amputation. You will see many transfemorals, or also known as above knee, transtibials, also known as uh, below knee, and partial foot amputations. There are other levels, rarer, such as hemicorporectomy, where half of the body is amb ambitiously removed. You're going to learn lots of new vocabulary, and you've already heard me say prosthetic. That's the adjective form of prosthesis. This is a device that replaces a part of the body, so you can have a prosthetic valve or eye in addition to a limb. An orthosis is a device externally added to the body to enhance function and or add support or stability. Learning all of the different options can be challenging. With partial foot amputees, we usually alter their shoes and offer fillers for within the shoe. But anything more proximal requires that you understand the categories of componentry comprising a prosthesis. They are mostly constructed with some kind of pylon, which is also known as an end endoskeletal construction. Anything touching or interfacing with the amputee is part of the socket. Whatever keeps it hanging on is the suspension. And then we have the various joints. Sockets are fab fabricated by a prosthetist, plaster casting the limb to create a replica of the residual limb. They can then stretch a thermoplastic sheet over it for total contact with different shapes for compression and relief depending on the pressure sensitive and pressure tolerant areas of the limb. The above knee amputee has different challenges with regard to socket design than the BKA. And sometimes the socket will include a liner for comfort, protection, or even to help keep the device on the limb. Ensuring the prosthesis stays on the below knee amputee can be done with flexible options like neoprene sleeves, leather cuffs above the condyles, gel locking liners, or waist belts with fork straps. The other type is to build it into the socket so that the trim lines grab above the condyles or the patella. The above knee amputee suspensions are similar with suction, with traditional gel locking liners, or fancier ones. Non-suction options include a leather belt, a neoprene sleeve, and sometimes more durable hardware. Above knee amputees will need a device that replaces their knee. For the ultimate stability, a manual locking knee is a hinge that is locked in extension and unlocked when they want to sit down. But if you want to have a knee that functions during gait, you need to build some friction into the hinge. 
when it's basically just that. It's called a constant friction knee, and you can basically only walk at one speed. If you combine a bunch of hinges, the resultant motion is the polycentric knee, which behaves very similar to a physiologic knee. You can make it so the hinge locks during stance and kicks out during swing. If the friction is provided by air, you get variability in the swing phase of gait, and water allows additional variability in stance. Adding a programmable computer can give you really amazing results if you can handle how heavy it makes the prosthesis. The simplest foot is a block of wood with a cushion in the heel, but a hinge in the ankle will quickly achieve foot flat stabilizing the knee. Multi-axis allows, multi-axis ankle allows navigating uneven territory. There are a continuum of options that allow conversion of stored potential energy at the start of stance into kinetic energy simulating plantar flexion at terminal stance. And we can put computers in ankles too. The purpose of all this is for them to achieve functional mobility, participate in recreation, and achieve a sense of wholeness in the context of limb loss. Just as an aside, the upper limb amputee can be approached similarly, but carries a host of other issues that make them challenging to rehabilitate. They can operate their hands and elbows either with body-powered or externally powered systems. Sophisticated cosmetic techniques continue to achieve more realistic looking hands and fingers. Not only will you scrutinize your amputee's gait patterns to identify ways to optimize their prosthesis, but I would argue that you will probably observe the gait of every patient you see during training. Although deep dive investigations into gait can occur in a gait lab, observational gait analysis is quite powerful as well. You'll learn all the phases of the gait cycle, how the body's center of mass propagates and con contributes to the ground reaction force. You'll learn when all of the muscles at each joint are contracting and if they are concentric or eccentric during the gait cycle. You'll learn how the determinants of gait contribute to the smooth gait in nature, rather than walking like an action figure doll. There's a little physics in play, and just like Neo in The Matrix, you just won't be able to unsee it once you learn it all. Depending on the existing deficit, you might prescribe assistive devices to promote safe functional gait. Canes have different shaped handles and can contact the ground with single or four tips. The white color of a visual impairment cane should already be familiar to you. If the four points need to be really wide, you can prescribe a hemi walker. A standard walker gets picked up to move, while a reciprocal will act like an inchworm. Some will need forearm support due to hand issues. Kids will usually do better with an opening at the front, and they even make one to climb stairs. The majority of my elderly deconditioned patients need what we call a rollator with a seat and hand brakes. Another type are crutches, which can allow more support to avoid a wheelchair. You've all seen axillary crutches. The forearm crutch offers a safe, easy substitute for cane, but less stable than the axillary crutch. Platform crutches allow unloading the painful arthritic hand and wrist. The two, three, and four point gait patterns offer progressive stability while sacrificing speed, while the swing through gait gives faster speeds than even normal gait. People with gait issues may sometimes need something attached to offer support of their limbs. The University of California Berkeley Laboratory Shoe Insert, or UCBL, encompasses the heel, controls the arch, and is custom fabricated to stabilize a flexible foot deformity. The AFO is probably the most prevalent for ankle foot stability. Work your way proximally to provide more stability to the knee, hip, and trunk. Ultimate safety with mobility comes in the form of a wheelchair, which you will learn to prescribe by learning all of its components. Each of these are customizable to the individual diagnosis, needs, and lifestyle of your patient, whether they be a high tetraplegic public speaker, double amputee athlete, or 100-year-old veteran who just wants to get around easier. If they can't propel themselves and they're competent to handle it, we can add a motor. Scooters have become ubiquitous, but they aren't great in the setting of disability. You can add a motor component to an existing wheelchair to turbocharge their own manual propulsion. And powered wheelchairs are where you can do all sorts of seating customization, add-ons, and cool interfaces like joystick, sip and puff, or head arrays. In addition to mobility, we can help with other challenges to the activities routinely performed throughout the day, no matter the medical condition. When laid up, fully electric hospital beds can help make position changes easier and provide pressure relief. 
We can offer lifts for getting in and out of their furniture and save their caregivers' backs. Toileting can become difficult despite retained bowel and bladder function. Some may even limit their oral intake in the hope of requiring fewer trips to the commode, as it can be a very stressful activity. So simple techniques and equipment can address this. When bathing becomes challenging, bathroom modifications and specialized equipment can change their lives. A mobile arm support or balanced forearm orthosis can be beneficial for patients with proximal upper extremity weakness. Built up utensils, angled shape, play cards, rocker knives, lightweight mugs can be helpful for self-feeding. Techniques and adaptive equipment facilitate efficient dressing with less energy consumed. In PMNR, we love our equipment. You'll recall I said we'd return to orthoses, which we defined as a device externally added to the body to enhance function and or add support or stability. This is essentially done by exerting force on the body at three points as shown in the figure. This can be applied to the shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, metacarpophalangeals, interphalangeals, and have simple to complex mechanisms to aid in functions. There are various locking mechanisms to optimize positioning and stability of orthoses. These can be seen with upper and lower limb orthoses. For the lower limb, we prescribe these quite often, such as with patellofemoral syndrome, or if to prevent hyperextension, protect the ACL, compress or unload the painful joint, protect a surgerized knee, or improve the motion after an inadequate surgery. You'll learn what to put inside a shoe to create a certain effect on the foot, ankle, or knee, and even learn the parts of the shoe which you may prescribe alterations of as well. So that's a nice place to pause. Just to round out the picture of who I am, this is my family, my colleagues, my Bitmoji, the Optimus Prime costume I made for Comic-Con, me with weird Al Yankovic and some silly stuff. Uh, some of you already know this side of me, but for the rest of you, this is just so you know that I'm a people person underneath all the official medical stuff. And this would be the time I would interact and for me to pull up the next presentation. Um, so it's a chance for you to stretch. Welcome to part two, the central nervous system stuff. Here we'll hit everything sitting in the skull and spine. For the brain, there's a lot we can address as physiatrists. Needless to say, the brain is a complicated organ, both structurally and functionally. You'll learn the lobes, established functional regions, the meninges, flow of cerebrospinal fluid, and also the major blood vessels. Vessel problems of all kinds, bleeds, clots, or perfusion related, can lead to profound functional disturbances collectively referred to as strokes. Stroke is the clinical presentation of disturbed cerebral function attributed solely to vascular issues. Bleeds are less common and initially more dangerous, but may recover better, and the majority are ischemic, often due to clots. How they initially present depends on which vessels are involved. You'll see different syndromes that correlate with the compromised portion of brain tissue. On your inpatient rotations, you'll be surprised at how familiar you become with these. For example, sudden vertigo, nystagmus, dizziness, and dysphagia is a classic presentation of lateral medullary syndrome and correlates with the cranial nerves within the lateral medulla. But unlike during your neurology rotations, how they present will occupy less of your time than how they recover. The majority will start in an acute care hospital and then be transferred to a facility such as acute or subacute rehabilitation. Or they'll be discharged to home with outpatient therapy or a visiting therapist. The rehab units are sometimes located inside the acute hospital, but often are found as separate facilities. Subacute rehabilitation similarly may be standalone, or they may be housed within a skilled nursing facility. These have many names, uh, but most people know them as nursing homes. Optimal choice for rehabilitation with these facility options depends on severity of the stroke neurologically, but also the associated problems, which are many as shown in this slide. You don't stop being a medical doctor in PMNR. In fact, you'll develop the expertise of dealing with these not so bread and butter issues as this is what makes up physiatrists on the inpatient side of things. But let's get back to function and mobility. Neurosurgeons and neurologists really won't have the practical prognostic data that you'll have. The patient's expectations regarding walking will be set by conversations you have. Initially, you'll lower the seat height on their wheelchair to allow for leg propulsion, encourage use of the unaffected side, and progress to walking with braces and assistive devices. You'll be the one helping the stroke victim navigate 
functional restoration, pointing out milestones, and working with the team to guide the, and expedite recovery. Most of the motor recovery occurs in the first three months, and there are accepted and very well delineated stages that require adapting. The proximal muscles improve first with increased tone before volitional motion, and it is synergistic before isolated movements can come back. Generally and overall, if the vision, bladder, or communication deficits don't recover within a month, you can expect slower overall recovery and deficits lasting longer. Bigger lesions may be worse than smaller ones, and 90% of stroke survivors will have some neurodeficit, but most will regain functional independence, while up to a third may be permanently disabled. It's useful to think of restoring function as either a consequence of neurological recovery or strategies to compensate for the lost function. For example, your right hand extension weakness after stroke may recover due to healing in the brain, or you may have to compensate with a brace or compensate by using your other hand. Rehabilitation has been proven to be a beneficial uh, intervention in all stroke severities, especially if it's early on and intense. There are a number of different established approaches to trying to facilitate neurological recovery that the therapist will choose based on experience and the patient. And we're constantly coming up with cool new ways to do this, including neuroprosthetics, robotics, and interactive virtual reality protocols. They routinely learn the compensatory strategies and are trained with equipment to compensate for function that doesn't return from neurological recovery. Stroke patients have plenty of overlap into the musculoskeletal outpatient domain where they develop the so-called stroke shoulder. Initially, the ball flops around in the socket while flaccid until the reverse occurs with increased tone. Eventually, this can unfortunately progress to the shoulder hand syndrome, which can be challenging to treat. The brain can also acquire functional deficits by direct or indirect injury. Trauma to the head can occur with car accidents, falls, and projectiles, creating an opening or in the skull or not. This is the primary injury. The severity is often classified based on the Glasgow Coma Scale of eye opening, verbal, and motor response. Loss of consciousness and amnesia durations are also used. A mild brain injury is also colloquially called concussion. Briefly, you will encounter mild brain injury or concussion in the context of pediatric and adult athletics, motor vehicle crashes, and military blast exposures. The grading and categorization can be challenging to wrap your head around. <laughs> However, the ones where imaging shows a lesion is more straightforward. Primary injury can be focal or diffuse. Focal injuries can be penetrating, yikes, or non-penetrating, which we call contusions. These are most common in the anterior, temporal, and orbitofrontal regions, regardless of site of impact. There will be damage from the initial impact and then a second impact, which are respectively called coup and contra-coup injuries. These exert uh, effect via hemorrhage, edema, tissue distortion, scarring, as visualized here. The other type of injury is called diffuse axonal, which is a twisting and tearing of axons arising from rotation of the brain around its axis. This affects midline structures and is associated with coma. Secondary injury is the process of delayed cell death due to a cascade of events. It's complicated, and I take great pride in being able to summarize this in one slide for you. The shearing associated with diffuse axonal injury mechanically tears up the neurons, leaking out excitatory amino acids. Sudden binding to their receptors causes massive ion infusions that swell up the brain cells. Calcium ions similarly leak out and cause tons of free radical style damage. This leads to swelling, which can lead to brain herniation and death. Mitochondrial stress induces enzymes that initiate apoptosis in a number of ways. One of them is literally called a death ligand. Anyway, these cause more direct cell death and swelling, which can lead to herniation and death. The primary injury causes leaky vessels and dysregulation, which contributes to swelling as well. To make matters worse, brain tissue is particularly vulnerable to oxidative injury in the first place because there's a baseline high rate of oxidative metabolic activity. Neurons are non-replicating and a few other geeky pathophys things that lead to an unpleasant situation occur. There are some known neuroprotective uh, pathways including neurotrophins, adenosine, and lactate conversion. Various changes in, con in consciousness occur after brain injury, including coma. This is defined as a state of pathologic unconsciousness in which the eyes remain closed and there is no evidence of purposeful motor activity. 
Vegetative state typically follows where there is some form of eye opening but without any response to the environment. A minimally conscious state is a condition of severely altered consciousness but in which there is definite re reproducible evidence of self-awareness or environmental awareness. You'll learn the many ways to measure these states. Rehabilitation can be more challenging if they carry another diagnosis. Many will have seizures, cranial nerve injuries, and fluid imbalances. Mental health and many of the issues we mentioned for stroke abound in this population as well. Although healing does occur to some degree, there are other mechanisms at play. These concepts are quite interesting, such as the idea that one area of the brain affects another or that they can substitute for each other through plasticity. Stroke and brain injury uh, patients will work extensively with speech and language pathologists. These are highly trained therapists that deal with three things. Speech is the process of producing sounds functional for communication. Language requires manipulating these sounds to the rules, meaning social aspects of communication. These therapists are also very much involved with restoring functional swallowing when there's an oral, pharyngeal, or esophageal issue. This is the chart from when I was a med student on thinking about communication issues. You can have conduction or sensory neural hearing loss, difficulty receiving, processing, or forming thoughts, issues with sound production or articulation in the mouth. Aphasias are disorders of understanding, thought, and word finding. These are usually seen with dominant hemisphere lesions. These are your uh, Wernicke's, Broca's, conductive, and transcorticals. The word dysphagia sometimes used for disorder of speech so that aphasia is reserved for absence of speech, but I wouldn't use it um, as I think it can be confused for dysphagia. Other than aphasia, communication can be affected in ways other than aphasia or dysarthria. Speech apraxias are the inability to do learned skills, and agnosias are the inability to recognize. Similar to other issues in rehabilitation, we can use compensatory strategies and devices to help restore function with compromised communication. Swallowing is necessary for survival. Abnormal swallowing or dysphagia leads to dehydration, starvation, aspiration pneumonia, or airway obstruction. It's frequently associated with cerebrovascular disease, traumatic brain injury, head and neck cancer, and other conditions common in rehabilitation patients. Although the bedside eval is the mainstay, you may be supervising video fluoroscopic evals where you see the juice or cookie going down the wrong pipe dynamically in real time. Scopes and fiber optics can be used when radiographic studies are difficult with the benefit of directly visualizing the pharynx and larynx. In many cases, swallowing impairments are amenable to rehabilitation treatment. As you can see, there are so many ways to help other than putting in a feeding tube. Hearing loss is quite frequently seen in PM&R, especially in the elderly, TBI, blast injuries, cerebral palsy, and multiple sclerosis. Society perceives them, the people with hearing loss, as rude or dull, and will affect their, and it, this affects their daily function. As someone with early hearing loss, I can attest to this. Along with speech, your team will now include ENT and audiology, who will employ clinical and audiological testing. As always, rehabilitation includes compensatory strategies and assistive devices like hearing aids and visual cues. These reduce anxiety and depression. Along with hearing, the inner ear includes the vestibular system, which can be severely compromised in the context of brain injury. The evaluation for dizziness or vertigo requires entertaining a broad differential. It can be the presenting complaint with a tumor, and I see a lot of people with benign positional vertigo in my clinic. There are a number of exercises employed to expedite recovery, all of which are collectively called vestibular rehabilitation. Profound vision deficits obviously can severely affect function. There's a lot that can be done, but usually this is offered by a vision rehab team rather than a physiatrist. And finally, just to round out the head, other issues that can affect the brain include dystonia, which is a challenging issue for all clinicians, as well as Parkinson's disease and its variants. These are all amenable to rehabilitation while working with a neurologist for optimal medical management. So that's the brain, and here's a comic entitled Life of a Medical Student, which I think we can all identify with. Honestly, the brain isn't where I spend most of my work day. It's in the spine and the limbs, and there are so many cool things we can do to help uh, with these issues. The spine is a stack of bones called vertebrae. Between the skull and thoracic are cervical. The ones attached to the ribs are called thoracic. Below that are lumbar. Then there's a fused section called the sacrum, which has an itty-bitty vestigial bone. 
Starting at the top, C1 is a ring called atlas that holds up the skull. C2, or axis, is a pivot joint. C3 through 6 are generic, while C7 is the transition from cervical to thoracic. The lumbar vertebrae look very different from the other levels. Throughout the spine, we have ligaments front to back to limit movement. When atlas loses its connection to the skull, it's called an atlanto-occipital dislocation. This internal decapitation is survivable and usually surgically addressed. But sometimes you might see people placed in a halo if it's due to ligamentous incompetence. When the atlas rings break, it's called a Jefferson fracture or C1 burst fracture. Moving down to C2, if fractures disconnect the front from the back, then it will separate from C3 and you get the classic hangman's fracture. C2's odontoid projects up to the foramen magnum and can also be fractured. Fractures of the typical vertebrae, C3 through 7, can be categorized by their mechanisms of compression, distraction, or rotation. There are several classification systems for orthosurgeons to know. In PMNR, we worry about spine stability. You can look at the imaging for sagittal displacement, angulation, jumped facets, but many people use the three-column model for the spine introduced by Dennis in the 80s, which breaks it up into front, middle, and back segments. Disruption of two or more columns results in instability and risk of spinal cord injury. Similar principles apply to thoracic spine fractures seen with gunshot wounds and car accidents. I mostly see anterior or wedge compression fractures in the context of osteoporosis. This is a great time to mention that bone is a dynamic structure which responds to and adapts to the loads applied through it. If loading on a particular bone increases, the bone will remodel itself over time to become stronger to resist that sort of loading. If loading decreases, the bone will be adapted and become weaker. It's interesting, gymnasts are seen to have higher bone mineral density than volleyball players, everywhere except for the pelvic bone. Back to osteoporosis. While in internal medicine you spent most of your time thinking about meds for this, there are actually a lot of things we can do in physiatry, including muscle re-education, reduction of kyphotic deformity, mobilization, bracing, and pain management. There's good research showing that back extensor strengthening and proprioceptive training with weight-bearing exercises can reduce disability, risk of future fractures, and back pain. Back pain is one of the top musculoskeletal complaints you're going to be evaluating. Globally, it contributes to uh, economic inequality, preferentially affects poverty, and is costly to the system in treatment and lost work hours. We ask a lot of red flag questions because back pain can be the herald of some scary things like cancer, fracture, and infection. After that, we perform an extensive physical examination to determine if there may be a neurological issue. Or non-neurological, simply bed rest can exacerbate back pain because prolonged supine position encourages localized, prolonged, isometric, low-intensity contractions in the back. It's reassuring to know that most back pain gets better in six weeks, whether you treat it or not. As usual, muscles don't get enough attention, even though they are so important to offering dynamic stability to the spine. We're not just talking about the little ones attaching each segment to the next, but also the glutes and hamstrings, and abdominals and pelvic floor muscles. Most back pain improves if you address the strength and coordination of these muscles collectively called the core. The celebrity structure in the spine tends to be the intervertebral disc, which separates vertebrae, offers cushioning, and motion. Like a jelly donut, the annulus fibrosis are spirally arranged concentric collagen rings with nucleus pulposus in the center. In addition to those two parts, superiorly and inferiorly, there are a layer of hyaline cartilage called the cartilaginous end plate. It is adjacent to the vertebral end plate, which is composed of cortical bone. As you can see here, it functions as a mechanical barrier between the pressurized nucleus pulposus and the vertebral bone, and serves as a gateway for nutrient transport via these vessels. Here's a close-up schematic of the bone, cartilage, annulus, and nucleus. Here's a histological stain and an MRI of the same thing. A disc bulge is when the dough of the jelly donut is out beyond the margins of the bones. Degenerative discs are dried out and smaller. Disc herniations are the ones where the jelly squirts out in varying degrees. If it hasn't made it out of the dough, it's a protrusion. If uh, extrusion is when it has made it out of the dough, and sequestration is when it's lost connection to the parent disc. If the nucleus pulposus herniates up into the vertebra, it's called a Schmorl's node. Disc herniations are seen in a large part of the asymptomatic population. They're constantly herniating and 
they are constantly regressing spontaneously without surgical intervention. The body probably gobbles it up. And it's interesting because the worse the herniation, the better the chances it'll disappear on its own. So now that we've addressed the patient's, I've got a disc, I want to address the arthritic spine. The word spondylosis for you guys is as good as spine arthritis. It's wear and tear, drying out, spurring, and just plain yuck on x-ray and MRI. So this brings us to a messy term, spinal stenosis. As you already know, technically, the word stenosis means a smaller diameter. It can refer to anatomic findings seen on imaging. But I hear people referring to it as a syndrome or even a pattern of electrodiagnostic findings. So I tried to clarify some of the terminology with this slide. When talking about spinal stenosis, it can be of congenital or acquired etiology. It can be central or lateral. When it is lateral, there are zones that can be identified to further detail it. These are particularly important in radiculopathy. The syndrome is the unfortunate neurogenic claudication that comes from a complex set of contributing factors. The classic shopping cart sign is that of an elderly person limited by radiating pain while walking erect, but can tolerate it when leaning forward. Just below the lumbar spine is the sacroiliac joint, which has a complicated anatomy, biomechanics, and can be the site of the pain. Given that we are the home of the tailbone doctor of the world, it would be deeply disappointing if I didn't point out that the coccyx is the final location of the spine where pain and dysfunction can be addressed. As we previously talked about orthoses as three-point pressure systems applying forces to support, limit, and stabilize, Spine orthoses can be helpful in a number of the conditions we just mentioned. You'll learn the pros and cons that influence prescription, including balancing motion with support and comfort. There are a lot, and they aren't easy to memorize initially because many are named for the guys who invented them. But one easy way is to name it based on the body part it's affecting. For example, cervical orthoses can be used to warm the neck, support it, or totally immobilize it during transportation after a sports injury. Head cervical orthoses will offer even more support, and you will be seeing a lot of patients with these on your SCI rotations. Extending it down to the trunk will offer the most support, and you will learn how to manage issues associated with the halo orthosis on the right. Descending the spine, you can limit flexion, extension, lateral bending, and rotation at the lumbosacral spine or the entire way down the spine, especially after fracture or post-op. They can be clamshell, custom molded, or prefabricated. And in the outpatient world, you'll be dealing with flexible versions of these. Kids with scoliosis are a special population with a specific set of braces that have been shown to prevent curved progression. These kids aren't thrilled with wearing them all day, so now there are nighttime versions as well. Scoliosis is a troubling lateral curvature of the spine that progresses in the growing child if not addressed. It can be due to existing def defects, neuromuscular conditions, or for no identifiable reason at all. The prior slide already presented the various braces. Surgical correction is warranted with a Cobb angle of greater than 40 degrees. Otherwise, you can develop myelopathy, which refers to any pathology of the spinal cord, which is a long list, but in my clinic, I'm mainly seeing this due to arthritic spurs and herniated discs. What about if you get a knife through your cord? Or let's say you broke your spine and it severed your spinal cord. That's when we call it spinal cord injury. And there's a lot you have to do initially. You have to immobilize their spine and keep them alive as you transport them uh, to a trauma center. They'll be in spinal shock for a while. They'll have surgery in these obvious cases, but it can be a more challenging decision in more nuanced situations. When they've stabilized, you'll give them a diagnosis per criteria by the American Spinal Injury Association determined by an extensive exam of light touch and pinprick sensation and manual muscle testing of key muscle groups. Finally, based on their anal sensation, you will label them with a letter that says how complete or incomplete the lesion is. This diagnosis offers a lot of guidance for treatment and prognostic power. For example, based on the level of injury, there will be predictable losses of cardiovascular reflexes. Above T1, the vagus dominates without the sympathetics balancing it. Injuries above T6 will affect splanchnics, etc. Blood pressure and heart rate will be out of whack too. Feedback from baroreceptors gets blocked at the level of injury, so the vessels stay dilated and blood doesn't get to the brain. 
When you're on your SCI rotations, you'll reflectively start elevating patients as they pass out in front of you. This improves over time on its own. But we do use a lot of techniques and some meds to help them along. Because SCI hits all of Virchow's triad, with increased platelet aggregation, increased factor eight activity, and slow fibrinolytic response, it's no surprise that pulmonary embolism and DVT prevention and management are a huge part of the medical management during acute rehabilitation stay. You'll start to develop a sixth sense about DVTs and PEs when on call. One of the only emergency issues owned by PMNR is the autonomic dysreflexia seen with spinal cord injury that occurs above the sympathetics. Essentially, some noxious stimulus like a full bladder or an ingrown toenail can't send signals up the cord for us to normally address. If you felt that, you would move your leg or take away the stimulus. So because it, you can't feel it in, with a spinal cord injury, adrenaline and other sympathetics kick in, causing widespread vasoconstriction and hypertension. This is detected by the baroreceptors. So the vagus then tells the heart to slow down so that the pressure can decrease. But that's not going to happen until the sympathetics shut down. And that's not going to happen until that, the noxious stimulus can be removed. Unfortunately, this leads to a pounding hypertensive headache, seizures, and eventually death due to hypertensive hemorrhage. This is where the physiatrist can be the hero by recognizing it, treating the symptoms, and addressing the cause. Diseases of the respiratory system are the leading cause of death after SCI. 72% are due to pneumonia, which is the leading cause of death at all time periods post-injury and highest in tetraplegia. The main problem after SCI is the difficulty clearing secretions, the atelectasis, and the hypoventilation. C3 through 5 keeps the diaphragm alive and is affected with SCI at these levels. With, inner, with a innervated diaphragm and nothing else, Vital capacity will be one liter. Below C5 have incompletely innervated intercostal muscles, which decreases the ability to take a deep breath. In all levels, even to T10, secretion clearance is an issue because of weak cough due to abdominal muscle weakness. Paradoxical breathing may also be seen in tetraplegics. Deep inspiration results in a, the abdominal uh, wall rising while the chest sinks in due to low tone in chest wall and abdominal musculature and use of diaphragm as the only muscle of inspiration. It gets very interesting and very complicated very quickly, so it's something to, to review. Reintroducing the bladder, normally the kidney filters, concentrates, and secretes and the ureters carry urine as they tunnel through the bladder wall. Urine will sit there collecting until it's time to pee. The bladder wall muscle or detrusor contracts while the internal sphincter relaxes in a coordination fa coordinated fashion and you pee. All the innervation of the bladder is here. Afferents detect bladder distension while alpha adrenergics contract the sphincter while beta relax the bladder. Acetylcholine stimulates bladder contraction. These are through the hypogastric and pelvic nerves, while the pudendal offers voluntary control over the external sphincter. The central nervous system in the anterior pons, cerebrum, and cerebellum also exert some control. So, after spinal cord injury, neurogenic bladder dysfunction complicates daily function with associated urinary tract infections. SCI will cause loss of coordination between the brain and everything below. Brain problems cause loss of inhibition, so you're always going. If the sacral elements are affected, you, your bladder just sits and doesn't contract. If one of the nerves is affected, it's atonic. One management technique is to periodically self-catheterize. Based on the presenting problems, there are medications which can help as well. The gut has its own inherent nervous system called the Auerbach's and Meisner's plexuses. The parasympathetics from the vagus and pelvic nerve and sympathetics exist from T5 to L2 via mesenteric and hypogastric nerves. So spinal cord injury will lead to compromised bowel. After the initial ileus resolves from shock, a bowel program is initiated based on the type of injury. 
SCI causes upper motor neuron bowel problems where the combination of compromised propulsion and chronically closed sphincter leads to constipation and impaction. Stool softeners, laxative, fiber, and some digital stimulation can be helpful. This is called a program, and this can program the bowel to get patterned for movement. Lower motor neuron injuries will cause flaccidity, which also leads to constipation, but for a different reason. The same denervation affects the reproductive organs, which have to be addressed along the way. Spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury both can lead to bone formation where it shouldn't normally. This heterotopic ossification limits range of motion and can be quite painful. Triple phase bone scan will have activity on phase one, which is blood flow, early, and phase two, blood pooling. Third phase will be positive one week later, but before x-ray is positive. Sometimes surgery to debulk or radiation can be helpful. As part of the upper motor neuron syndrome, the central nervous system's inhibitory influence is lost. This results in a velocity-dependent increase in muscle tone, which can cause discomfort and affect function. We use the modified Ashworth scale to assess degree of spasticity, and we have many approaches to treating it. As you all know, multiple sclerosis is a debilitating condition due to demyelinating plaques in both the brain and spinal cord. It's variable and unpredictable disease with many variations on the issues we've already covered. Treating the pain and the disease is an active process that neurology usually manages, but sometimes physiatrists have taken this on as well. So let's breathe a sigh of relief as we move on to the final segment of our trilogy. We've covered a lot of general rehabilitation as it relates to deconditioning, amputees, and central nervous system issues. Now it's time to look at musculoskeletal and peripheral neuromuscular medicine, which is where I spend most of my time. As you know, neurons are cells serving as the structural and functional units of the nervous system, sending messages from one part of the body to another. Structurally speaking, the majority that physiatrists deal with are multipolar, which have variably branched processes projecting in many directions for diversified input that is integrated at the cell body. Bipolar are seen in sensory organs like the eyes and nose, and unipolars are limited to invertebrates. But please take note of the pseudo-unipolar neurons. They have two processes which fuse during their development into one short common axon, which splits into one branch that terminates in the periphery, while the second branch heads to the spinal cord. This way, stimuli from the periphery bypass the cell body and reach the axon terminal without delay. If you slice a nerve, you'll see that it has a skin or epineurium. Inside are bundles or fascicles surrounded by connective tissue called perineurium. The bundled axons are themselves surrounded by a matrix called endoneurium. Here we see the rootlets extending from the spinal cord and coalescing to form the roots. Wherever this happens, we call it a spinal level, such as C7 level. The ventral root joins the thickening of the dorsal root, which is called the dorsal root ganglion, or DRG, to form the spinal nerve. Notice that the DRG is essentially sitting within the neuroforamen. Let's deviate to pathophysiology for a moment. There are two types of damage to nerves. Demyelination is a preferential injury to a segment of the myelin sheath where conduction will be affected. Remyelination can, can, can occur with shorter internodal lengths, but function will be restored. If the cell body is affected, then the entire cell dies and disintegrates. If only the axon is damaged, uh, then the Schwann cells and axon around the injured segment degenerates in addition to everything distal from there to the end organ. This is called Wallerian degeneration. Eventually, regeneration can occur if there's a clear path to the end organ. This is pretty straightforward for the motor neurons, but it's a different story for the pseudo-unipolar axons sitting in the dorsal root. As you can see here, only one projection degenerates while the other remains intact. So if you were to test this degenerated segment, it would be abnormal. But if you tested the intact segment, it would appear to be normal. So let's apply this and review the relevant anatomy now. The two keys to this are to remember that the locations of cell bodies are different for motor neurons and sensory neurons. Sensory is here and motor is here. If the black line demarcates site of injury, such as we see with radiculopathy, Wallerian degeneration eventually occurs distal to the lesion in relation to the cell body when an axon is damaged. As you can see, 
the degeneration uh, will proceed peripherally when the ventral root is damaged. However, the degeneration will occur uh, centrally when the dorsal root is damaged. This location of dorsal root damage is described as preganglionic for this reason. This leaves the peripheral sensory axons intact over here. Um, and sensory studies will be normal despite the patient clinically howling in pain and uh, numb in that dermatome. Returning to our discussion of anatomy, notice that this is now over here a mixed nerve uh, and it's called the spinal nerve and it branches into both uh, dorsal and ventral primary rami. Uh, I felt so proud of my drawing abilities and later found the exact same thing on the Google later. So all of that will be very important to apply when you see a patient with suspected radiculopathy, but let's move distally. The term motor unit refers to the anterior horn cell, its axonal projection, and all of its associated terminals, junctions, and muscle fibers. Here you see two motor neurons projecting to a muscle belly, the blue one has many neuromuscular junctions with a set of muscle fibers interdigitating between muscle fibers belonging to another motor neuron in red. Here we can see them histologically with motor end plates, axons, uh, and muscle fibers, and even the spindle in real life. So here is, whoops, let's get this here. Here's the spindle, here are the axons, and here are the motor end plates and the muscle fibers, of course. An action potential causes an influx of calcium ions at the nerve terminal where vesicles filled with acetylcholine are mobilized, docked, and primed to the membrane before exocytosing into the synapse. These vesicles have numerous proteins which we target with botulinum toxins. If acetylcholinesterase in the synapse doesn't gobble it up, acetylcholine will bind to receptors on the muscle membrane, initiating a new action potential and muscle contraction. We talked about muscles in depth already, and we briefly mentioned tendon before. It's specific collagenous tissue that attaches the muscle to the bone. This family medicine paper shows healthy tendon with the collagen all pristine and organized. Within activity, you get a degeneration or tendinosis. The term tendonitis refers to acute inflammation, which this does not represent. The encapsulated Golgi tendon organ sits within the tendon detecting tension developed by muscle contraction, but not by stretch. Magnified with tension, the yellow helices over here uh, are collagen pinching the interwoven red 1B afferent axons. This signals for tr relaxation when sensing overloading of the muscle, such as when you're uh, lifting too much weight and then you suddenly fail. You'll hear a lot about the spindle too if you talk to osteopaths or deal with spasticity. It's an encapsulated organ that lies in parallel with the rest of the muscle belly that sends information about the length of the muscle back to the central nervous system. Fibers within the spindle are called intrafusal. Anything outside it, the skeletal muscle you usually think about, is called extrafusal. So there are afferents sending signals back to the CNS about how long the muscle is, and there are efferents to the spindle stimulating contractile elements within. The intrafusal efferents are motor neurons. Not the alpha motor neurons you see going to skeletal muscle. These are gamma motor neurons. They're stimulating these nuclear bag fibers and chain fibers, and these actually will contract. I'm going to tell you how this works now. The spindle is constantly sending signals up to the central nervous system, as seen in this top picture. It's going dee 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 dee. When the alpha motor neuron stimulates the skeletal muscle to contract, the belly shortens. The CNS gets signals that the spindle is now slackened. So the gamma motor neuron stimulates the contractile part of the spindle to shorten as well, removing the slack on it. And so it's back to and this is how the spindle works. With that anatomy and physiology out of the way, most of my day is spent addressing musculoskeletal issues which I was basically able to summarize in this one slide. These can affect any part of the body. I rarely see bony fractures or bruises, but I do see a lot of inflammation or irritation of bursae, fascia, and tendons, and their attachment sites. I see strains and sprains, and when cartilage defects occur, we have our musculoskeletal syndromes, and there are some major categories to go over. 
Those of you excited about sports medicine need to understand everything we do and apply it to the athlete. You have to understand biomechanics, development, nutrition, and emergency care. You will be competing with surgeons and family practice docs when you run out on the field to save the day. Other than these, there are a number of specific pain disorders that can be challenging to deal with. Of these, us generalists get pretty deep into the pre presentation and treatment of myofascial pain because it is so prevalent in our population. On exam, we see taut bands and trigger points all the time, and we have lots of ways to treat it. There are numerous medications that can be prescribed if you choose to do so, but with the opiate crisis, hopefully many have started moving in a different direction. I've always believed in the osteopathic principle of mind, body, and spirit being connected, even though I am myself not uh, an osteopath. Western healthcare systems have increasingly incorporated more non-traditional approaches from the rest of the world. It's getting more complicated as they try to further classify. We can use needles to poke holes in muscles, bathe with corticosteroids and anesthetics, and we can do this using landmarks, ultrasound, and x-rays. I do a fair amount of these during my work week as a component of my treatment regimen. In the past few decades, there has been a surge in interest in ways to regenerate the degenerated tissues. Autologous means you take some part of the person's body and put it back in another part of their body. I think this slide says it all, that this is a subject of controversy at this time, but the evidence is accumulating enough that it could also stay with us in our future. I just don't think people will be as excited about performing these when it's FDA approved and they're getting paid by Medicare rates rather than out-of-pocket rates. Many of you will go for further fellowship training in what I affectionately call injectology. These are procedures, usually involving the spine, with the goal of targeting a specific structural pain generator. Personally, I would have become a surgeon if I wanted to do procedures all day long. The truth is, after performing a comprehensive evaluation, educating the patient on how to get better, reassuring them, and motivating the heck out of them, I'm usually referring them for some combination of therapy, where various techniques are implemented toward achieving a restorative goal. Physical therapists use mostly physical methods to restore physical activities. Occupational therapists typically focus on activities of daily living, but there's definitely overlap and the distinction can be murky where physical therapists work toward function and some OTs even specialize in musculoskeletal hand therapy. Rec therapy uses recreational tasks as interventions and we already discussed speech and language pathology. Like other docs, Physiatrists prescribe therapy, but it should be a bit more sophisticated script than evaluate and treat. The script starts by outlining goals based on pre-existing function, existing morbidities, and realistic anticipated prognosis. Then we use a systematic approach with the tools in our bag to get them there. We have already discussed conditioning, strengthening, equipment, etc., but it may be beneficial to discuss modalities. So modalities are passive treatments, meaning they're being done to the patient rather than them taking an active part. The modalities are the therapeutic physical agents that now are an adjunct to active treatments. These include hot and cold, electrical stimulation, manual techniques, and although less prevalent, hydrotherapy. And there's also light-based techniques. Heat can be transferred a number of ways other than direct contact. We can apply it at various depths. Hot packs and heating pads are probably the most frequent. Then hot paraffin. Fluidotherapy is a machine that uses corn husks, radiant heat, and even hot stones. For the deep heat, ultrasound seems to be the main option that has stuck around. You can get the body cold with ice packs, aggressive ice massage, cryo units, and even vap vapocoolant spray. Electricity-based systems are quite prevalent. TENS units deliver small currents to the surface in an effort to distract the pain pathways. IFC TENS just does this in a different way to deliver it deeper. Iontophoresis is when you use electricity to force medication into the tissue, and neuromuscular electrical stimulation is the use of electricity to create some functional activity. This overlaps a bit with the field of prosthetics when used in devices. Therapeutic application of your hands on the patient is a broad topic with many powerful techniques that can include several categories of massage, the stuff osteopaths and chiropractors are taught, but also things like athletic taping or traction. There are indications, contraindications, precautions, and ample literature to review for all of these. For the completists, we used to use hydrotherapy, especially for wounds, but it is time and labor intensive. Light, magnet, vibration therapies, these also would fall under the, the, this world, but they're less prevalent.
The therapist will also tap into the patient's own various biological signals as a source of feedback for the patient to expedite their progress. Let's move on to the topic of uh, neuromuscular medicine and quickly review what we mean when we say neuromuscular. Sensation in teal here, look at this pathway as I talk. Sensation in teal begins with a stimulus in the periphery that travels through nerves and plexuses to reach the cell bodies. And those are located in the dorsal root ganglia just outside the spinal cord over here. Another axonal projection goes up the spinal cord and then synapses uh, abound within the brain. Conversely, the motor pathway starts with a thought in the brain. An upper motor neuron crosses over and synapses with a lower motor neuron in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. The axon traverses the ventral root, plexuses, peripheral nerves, and then causes movement. This whole motor pathway is what we're going to spend our time thinking about today. So let's deepen the discussion. Remember this slide, the differential for weakness in internal medicine? Versus the systematic proximal to distal neuraxial approach that we use in PM&R. So I just wanted to clarify uh, what I mean by the neuromuscular conditions. And this is the way I teach my trainees when they're first learning. I organize the conditions based on the proximal to distal site of primary pathology, like we just went through. We start most proximally with motor neuron disorders like ALS. Next are the anatomical sites of lesions such as roots, plexus, or specific nerves. Polyneuropathies are next, which can be further subdivided as axonal or demyelinating. Neuromuscular junction disorders such as Lambert-Eaton, botulism, and uh, myasthenia gravis. And finally, muscle pathology of different causes, the myopathies. So starting with motor neuron disorders, they can affect motor neurons in the central and peripheral nervous systems. Both upper and lower motor neuron diseases present with weakness, which leads to atrophy and flaccidity with lowers. Reflexes and spasticity accompany the upper motor neuron injuries. Finally, electrodiagnostic testing will only be beneficial with lower motor neuron conditions. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is the one I encounter most often. It's usually a sporadic, progressive, degenerative disorder of unknown etiology that characteristically affects both upper and lower motor neurons, but spares sensory and autonomic function. Diagnosis isn't always straightforward, especially early in the illness when, symptom when symptoms are anatomically restricted. The weakness affects mobility, respiratory muscle function, and even sometimes is associated with a pseudo-bulbar affect. We usually get involved somewhere at the time of diagnosis and stay through to the end of life. So that's just a taste of one of the many motor neuron disorders. As we move through systematic differential, the nerve roots can be affected. The term for this is radiculopathy. It presents with weakness, pain, and altered sensation in the affected myotomes and dermatomes. For the junior residents, some of this may be new to you, but you can get fooled by referral patterns emanating from other places. For example, you can see sclerotomal, sclerotomal patterns on the right, referral patterns from the guts and organs, intervertebral discs, muscle, and facet joints. The roots themselves are fickle. In fact, one study injecting roots at various levels found a variation from the dermatomes and even side-to-side -side differences within the same person. So it takes some experience to distinguish these and you will learn so much more. Proceeding distally to the next structure, physiatrists are uniquely suited to figuring out brachial plexus pathology. This is due to a solid understanding of the anatomy, syndromes, and electrodiagnostic testing. Mononeuropathies are next, and they are particularly satisfying to diagnose and treat as we use clinical electrodiagnostic and now ultrasound uh, modalities to accurately expedite treatment. When we're faced with more than one nerve, peripheral polyneuropathies can be characterized by their pattern of presentation. During your time as a medical student, you saw ample diabetic and alcoholic neuropathies, which may be more of a stocking glove distribution, but there is also a multifocal mononeuropathy presentation. These can be acquired or hereditary, as you will likely see on your pediatric rotation. They can also be categorized by histopathology, primarily affecting the myelin sheath, or the axons. Axonal can affect sensory motor or both. Demyelination can be subclassified into segmental, like GBS, versus uniform, like Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. 
The neuromuscular junction is next on our systematic path. We can break these diseases up into sites of pathology, presynaptic like Lambert-Eaton and botulism, synaptic space issues like organophosphate toxicity, and the more commonly encountered postsynaptically mediated myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis diagnosis may come up, but I don't really see these too often, and the treatment is entrenched in neurology's domain anyway. But then again, there are some conditions we become uh, well-versed in just because of our training with electrodiagnosis, which we'll get to later. And I apologize, these are all videos from YouTube that are not working today. Since muscle is the final organ of, our, of the motor unit, myopathies have to be considered, especially in the setting of symmetric proximal weakness. They are classified by their causes, and most common to come to my clinic is the idiopathic inflammatory myopathies like polymyositis and inclusion body myositis. And even though my former residents have chosen not to see myopathies or other neuromuscular conditions as part of their careers, sometimes the physical exam findings choose to present to their clinic anyway. Your boards will require you to know on biopsy that dermatomyositis presents with perifascicular atrophy and perivascular infiltrates, while IBM has inclusion bodies in addition to these T-cell endomysial infiltrates, which is also common in polymyositis. Some of you may choose to perform biopsies if you train in a neuromuscular fellowship, but all of you hope to become proficient in electrodiagnosis, as is required to be board-certified physiatrists. So what is electrodiagnostic medicine? The human body's electrical discharges can be recorded, displayed, measured, and interpreted by the use of instrumentation. When disease alters the architecture and physiology of nerves and muscles are altered, observable changes in the discharges can be useful for establishing a diagnosis. You can also monitor disease prog uh, progression, and you can assess, therapeutic, uh, assess the benefit of therapeutic interventions. The benefits of testing are confirming clinical suspicion, addresses the neuromuscular differential, and it guides other diagnostic testing and imaging. But it can bring more value than just diagnostic. Many clinicians are unaware that numerous studies have shown excellent recovery and return to work with non-surgical treatments when abnormalities are present on electrodiagnostic testing paired with imaging. They're also associated with statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvements on disability, prognosis, and response to treatments when compared to those that have normal tests. The testing is generally preceded by a short history and physical exam in order to generate a working peripheral neuromuscular differential. Because there are shocks and needles involved, there are some people who may opt out of the test. Shocks are delivered to the body for nerve conduction testing. After the nerve is stimulated with this exogenous current, pickup electrodes elsewhere on the body display the electrical activity generated by nerves or muscles. The picture on the screen is called the evoked response. The x-axis measures time and the y-axis measures voltage. So this is what the setup ultimately looks like, but what you don't see is that I first abrasively swabbed the hand to improve contact and decrease impedance. Then I stuck the electrodes on. If they're not self-adhering like these EKG tabs, then we use tape. Then I put some conducting gel down, just like the ultrasound probe. And then after I dip my stimulator wand in the gel, I put it on the patient where the nerve is. When we press the button, current is delivered throughout the body and we see this on the screen. It's called stimulation artifact, and it's what the computer treats as time equal to zero. We keep increasing the number of amps, and then maybe how long the duration of current is delivered. Then we look at the evoked waveform to decide how much stimulation we're giving. If there's only uh, a stimulation artifact, it's called subthreshold stimulus. Once we start to see a little blip, that's threshold. And then it's submaximal stimulation. Until it stops changing, then we call it maximal. Then we crank it up and add another 20% of juice, and this is called supermaximal stimulation to ensure the entire nerve is stimulated. You'll spend three years learning to optimize this technique, and here I'm sharing the technique that I teach my residents. When the pickup electrodes are picking up over sensory nerves, we, we call it a sensory nerve action potential, or SNAP. The SNAP is the sum of the axolemal depolarizations under the electrodes. It has an amplitude, onset, and peak latencies, which we measure and analyze, and uh, here are a few more. To understand what this waveform really is, you'll have to remember, these action potentials are summations of all of the action potentials of each of the ac axons. You've learned about how these are generated by the opening and closing of voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. The nerve is a bundle of bundles of axons of all sizes, 
Larger ones have larger amplitudes and conduct faster. So if you counted all of them and plotted them by size in a histogram, it would look like this. Then if you took those and correlated them to voltages like they did here for a cat nerve, the result looks a lot like an actual snap potential. In unmyelinated nerves, this propagates very slowly by depolarizing adjacent membrane. When a Schwann cell full of gooey myelin wraps itself around the axon at intervals, you get the so-called saltatory conduction. Basically, the ions are flowing intraaxonally to neighboring nodes conducting far faster than in unmyelinated nerves. So now you can understand that the pickup electrode attached to the skin basically works like a microphone. It's picking up the traveling wave of depolarization through the skin, and you start to see a waveform. As it propagates away, the displayed waveform changes. Now, in order to explain what happens in the machine, I had my former resident draw this, and I put this animation together for you. The stimulator delivers current to the nerve, and the action potential propagates to the hand. The three electrodes pick up the activity and feed it into a differential amplifier, which amplifies the difference between the different electrodes. The resultant signal is then filtered and converted into computer ones and zeros, so it can be stored, manipulated, and measured. This can then be heard through a speaker, and the evoked response can then be viewed on a display. The terms orthodromic and antidromic stimulation just mean that we can obtain these waveforms by stimulating and picking up in the same or opposite direction as it physiologically conduction, conducts. Once you have a waveform on the screen, you want to look at the latency, which is how long it took to conduct from stimulator to the pickup electrode, the amplitude, which is how beefy the response is. With good technique, this reflects the number of axons in the nerve. And then less important are the phases and velocity. When the same process is performed over a muscle belly, it's called a compound muscle action potential. The C-map represents all of the depolarizing sarcolemma under the pickup electrode. These are bigger, so they look cleaner. Beyond the typical snaps and C-maps, many special nerve conduction studies and techniques have been described, and you should be familiar with them even if you don't perform them. One more common variation is the late responses, where you do the same thing as the CMAP studies, but wait a little longer. The stimulation causes the action potential to travel up to the spine and back to the hand or foot again, allowing you to assess proximal segments. These include the H reflex, which is the electrophysiologic equivalent of the Achilles reflex, the F wave, and the A wave. There's another special set of tests where you stimulate something in the periphery and pick up over the scalp or neck. These evoked potentials can arise from stimulating the skin, muscles, eyes, and ears. Neurosurgeons sometimes ask for us to do this as intraoperative monitoring to make sure they're not affecting the neurological tracts during surgery. Beyond nerve conduction studies, needle electromyography is a powerful and prevalent component of electrodiagnostic testing. A needle is inserted through the skin into the muscle, acts as a microphone within, and displays the voltages it detects. These pictures show you what's really going on. Here is a motor neuron right here uh, with all of its junctions and muscle fibers that it innervates. The spherical recording region at the tip of the needle uh, is uh, picking up all of these uh, single muscle fiber action potentials and summing them up to give you this motor unit action potential over here. In big muscles, you're only seeing the portion of the motor unit that's near the tip. The resultant MUAP, or motor unit action potential, has amplitude, duration, turns, and phases, which we analyze and interpret for clinical reasons. Motor units are voluntary activity and really just one type of finding when the needle is inserted. We also document insertional activity, which is anything that's happening when we move the needle. And spontaneous activity, this is seen if the patient is relaxed and we're not moving the needle. It's the fun pattern recognition part, like recognizing AFib or VTAC on an EKG. You'll spend a lot of time staring at the screen for this stuff. And you'll be distracted by various artifacts that will fool you along the way. EMG is not like EKG because denervation and reinnervation are dynamic evolving processes that are going to affect your findings. These include the timing of Wallerian degeneration and subsequent collateral sprouting, which will make your spontaneous activity disappear. 
Dr. Kraft demonstrated that fibs can get smaller over time as the muscle atrophies. And there is some controversy about the timing of appearance of fibrillations from proximal to distal. It's now time to hit everything else that uh, doesn't fit into the prior categories. We don't often think of uh, osteoarthritis as a rheumatologic condition because of the lack of uh, DMARDs. It's probably the single most common diagnosis I see though. As a result, I'm also finding rheumatologic diseases that others have mislabeled as osteoarthritis. We bring a lot of hope to all of these patients by helping them get functional. Uh, and there are various skin conditions we encounter in PMNR. Inactivity leads to pressure sores, which you're going to become an expert in managing. Amputees get verrucous hyperplasia with ill-fitting prostheses. Too much heating pad use leads to erythema abignae. These are always on our board exams. And you'll see every type of wound in your dysvascular diabetics. So take their shoes off for God's sake. If survived, extensive burns can lead to contractures, infections, and severe disability. The depth and total body surface area suggests the severity. The rule of nines is helpful in estimating it. Specific positions are better for preventing complications than others, and we can really help get them back to functional living. There's a whole world of pediatric rehab that nearly enticed me into fellowship. It was far more satisfying to me than actual pediatric medicine. I learned most of my adult rehabilitation principles during my peds rotations, believe it or not. Uh, these are topics, uh, there are specific topics in peds though. Spina bifida is one. Uh, it can be benign or result in paraplegia. Accompanied by brain malformations, neurosurgical interventions might be a part of their management. Cerebral palsy describes a group of permanent disorders of the development of movement and posture causing activity limitation that are attributed to non-progressive disturbances to the developing fetal or infant brain. CP is often accompanied by disturbances of perception, cognition, communication, and behavior by epilepsy and by secondary musculoskeletal problems. It can be classified by the neurological presentation or the regional presentation. These kids really benefit from us as we monitor their exam through development and try to game their system. We can accommodate deformities and address issues with tone, walking, posture. They have lots of other issues and we can advocate for them uh, with other clinicians who may not be as comfortable with the diagnosis. So that's PEDS. PM&R docs actually were pioneers in the management of lymphedema. Wound care nurses have taken on a lot of that groundbreaking work, but it came a lot from our field. Believe it or not, having a phys physiatrist on an organ transplant team has shown improved survival rates, work output, and quality of life. With cardiac transplant, loss of vagal inhibition to the sinoatrial node leads to high resting heart rate and blunted response to exercise. Usually there's associated pre-op deconditioning and de depression as well. Women with disabilities are a long way from full integration as they are disproportionately affected by discriminatory practices. Medical and pharmaceutical research has excluded women attributed to methodological issues about the menstrual cycle to liability concerns related to potential pregnancies. About five to 8% of girls have physical, cognitive, emotional, and learning disabilities. More abuse, early pregnancy, and lower employment rates and, out and uh, income less access to quality health care and sexuality education. They're more unemployed, socially isolated and deprived of social roles available to non-disabled women. Lack of access to information can prevent women with disabilities from achieving self-determination. They're not typically seen as wives and mothers due to fears of producing disabled children. And they suffer from the not good mothers stereotypes, including oppressive policies like sterilization and criminalization. Managing and adjusting disabled female uh, from beginning to menarche, menstruation, uh, irregularities, and the list goes on. We need to be at the forefront of this. To be honest, that's all I got to. There are still so many things I'd love to add to this, but you get the drift. I hope this was helpful, and um, you know, I hope that this has excited you about learning uh, for the future uh, as residents or that this has helped you decide how you're going to study for your boards.